Thank you so much for being here today, Jamie. You have an incredible journey so far, and honestly, I feel like you're just getting started. You recently published the book, you have your own media company, you're working on a TV docu-series, you have your own investment firm that invests in early stage underrepresented founders, as well as you just moved to San Diego. So you've got a lot on your plate. Uh, what I love most about your story is that your beginnings really feel so relatable, and I'm sure our audience members will be able to connect with your story. Uh, before we dive into learning about bootstrapping your business and then it being acquired by Unilever in 2017, I'd love to take it back a bit and just hear more about you, where you came from, uh, when you first got your you know, first entrepreneurial itch, were your parents encouraging of that? Yeah, hi, Madeline, thanks for having me. Um, it all goes back to, to a small town in Michigan where I was born, um, born into a, a, a perfect Midwestern household, um, had everything I needed, you know, while I was growing up, um, but I always had a sort of an itch uh, to explore, you know, beyond, beyond the small town, beyond the, beyond the, the perfect mid Midwestern sort of you know, household. Um, so I went to um, college at Michigan State, sort of just, chose that because my brother had gone there. My parents were willing to pay for it. Um, but all throughout school, you know, I, I had been soul searching. I was wondering what my calling was, you know, and I hadn't been exposed to a whole lot growing up. You know, I was a very small town. Um, my parents never, you know, talked a whole lot about our dreams and goals. And, you know, as, as when we get older and entrepreneurship was just never really in my thinking. Um, when you were when you were younger, did you have like any idea about like entrepreneurism, or did you have you know a maybe like babysitting or you know right. the typical lemonade yeah. stand, or was it truly like it just kind of fell into your lap then? Looking back now, I realize I there I had a few entrepreneurial en endeavors, so it was definitely within me. Um, I did babysit quite a bit. Um, I was really good at saving money from that too, you know, at a really young age. So I had, you know, that, that value, I guess, instilled in me. Um, I also hosted a lot of garage sales with my family. That was something that we did at my grandparents' house every summer. And I would run my own table. You know, I had my toys and I was responsible for managing the bank and negotiating prices. Um, and then a lemonade stand, you know, that was um, every kid's dream and, and something that my dad helped me. You know, we had this really kind of professional setup where I would laminate these save the date cards and um, create That's all these awesome. you know, marketing materials and things. So yes, I had it, I had it in me for sure. <laughs> and were your parents entrepreneurs at all or? No, my dad was an engineer. I worked for General Motors. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, and then I have an older brother, a few years older than me, and he went to school to become an accountant. Okay. Okay. So a little bit of, of business there with your, with your brother, but not much. So what did you decide to study in school? Business, actually. I, I kind of chose it because nothing was calling to me. I had a lot of friends who were, you know, creators and um, writers and musicians, and they had all these cool, you know, interesting um, <laughs> majors in college. And then there was me with business, which I didn't really know, you know, what that meant or what I wanted to do with it. Um, but I figured if I had a degree, it was a smart degree to have and I would you know eventually hopefully use it and I did <laughs> and so when everyone's asking like oh what are you going to do when you graduate what are you going to do when you graduate like what what was going through I hated mind? that question I like <laughs> I really didn't like it um you know I'd be at parties in school and that was always the first question what are you what are you studying you know fair enough um but for me I just didn't know and I you know I wished that I had this like really cool um, you know, thing to get into. Like my, my one friend was going to school for um, political science. And so she was, her plan was to move to Washington, DC and, you know, work on Capitol Hill. And, you know, for me, I was like, oh, business, we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, you know, later after graduation, it became clear, you know, that that was a smart choice. Um, and I, I ended up, I, I graduated um, with a degree with a focus in human resources, which I, I chose that because I thought, well, at least I'm working with people, you know, <laughs> and keep it interesting that way. Um, and I found myself working my way up the corporate ladder pretty quickly. Um, I moved to Chicago a couple years later after graduation and found myself working for the MacArthur Foundation, which is a really awesome foundation in downtown Chicago. You live there, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. I'm based in Chicago right now. Yeah. So I, I liked that. You know, I, they, they paid really well. The benefits were amazing. Um, but there was just still this sort of calling inside me where I wanted to, to do something more creative, just didn't quite know what that looked like yet. 
So you're in Chicago, you're working, working your way up the corporate ladder, probably giving yourself some prep talks in the morning, like you can do this because, you know, I feel that sometimes when you're an entrepreneur and you're in a corporate setting, there's like a little piece of your soul that, that dies. Cause you feel inside, like, this isn't really what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So you're working at MacArthur and, and then what happens? Where does your, your journey take you next? Then I, I came out to Portland, Oregon, um, visited, fell in love. And like what, I, what really drew me there was the creative energy of the city. Like everybody there was a maker or a creator of something. Um, and they always they used to say, you know, back, this was 2000, uh, I guess, back around the year 2000. Um, and they, they said, this is the place that people come to retire in their 20s. <laughs> so, like, <"All> right. <laughs> <laughs> so I came out and I, you know, of course, had to still get a job to sustain myself. And so I, I started working for Portland Public Schools and Human Resources. Um, but I promised myself I had one year to, to figure out what this, you know, creative calling was going to be. And, you know, I, I followed through with my, my promise. I was working for that one year to kind of save up money. Then I quit the job and I started just trying everything. Um, I was DIYing like every possible thing you can think of and taking classes on how to make different things. And were you thinking at that time, like, oh, I'm going to take this class, make this product and then, you know, sell it on Etsy or what was kind of like the mindset that you had? I was a business motivation at that time. I wasn't thinking about making money, um, but that became clear, you know, once I understood that I loved making personal care products, you know, Fast forward um, after a lot of trials and tribulations with like sewing and cooking and different things and interior design. Um, and then I started making lotions, deodorants and sunscreens and things in my kitchen. And it was partly because I was on a budget. I was also newly pregnant. So I wanted to make sure I was using healthy products on my skin. And then I just started making everything. Um, and in Portland, there's no shortage of opportunities to get out and sell. Um, so <clears throat> the farmer's markets were calling me, you know, I was very drawn to that opportunity, um, street festivals, and started selling. And then I realized pretty quickly there was a serious business potential in what I was doing. And finally, I realized um, there was my calling and I was able to, to transition my career into starting a business. But how, how did you go from like, oh, I'm making this you know, product in my kitchen. I really love making, you know, homemade beauty products to then like, oh, I think I could actually sell this and people are actually, you know, interested. I, I know it's Portland and yeah. kind of like the granola community started there, but at the time, like everyone was still using the big name brands, Dove, Secret. Um, and I, I feel like there's kind of a negative connotation almost with using natural deodorants um, that you would, you know, you still would smell or there was just only the you know Toms and and the you know more senior products on the shelves. Yeah, there was definitely a stigma attached to naturals. You know, the, a lot of people assumed they didn't work or that they were reserved for a certain type of customer. You know, very niche customer. Um, and it was true in 2010. There weren't a lot of options, um, as you mentioned. You know, Toms and me, and that was the big player in naturals. And a lot of people just didn't just found that it didn't work for them. Um, <clears throat> so having these conversations with the markets. I realized, you know, there was a there was a shared frustration around the existing options for natural deodorants, um, and I knew too, you know, not only could I create or wanted to create, you know, something that was more effective, but also something that looked different from what was on the shelves. Um, Naturals just had sort of a bland aesthetic back then, very predictable um, branding and packaging, and I saw opportunity to do that differently. I wanted to create fragrances that didn't yet exist. I wanted to. Um, to create a more modern sort of forward thinking packaging with, with bright colors. Um, so it just became clear that there was a, there was an empty space on the shelf. Um, and so I started, you know, I kept continuing on with the markets, getting validation from my customers that the product was working um, and also using my customers as a focus group. You know, it was really great to have these people in front of me every week, giving direct feedback on the product, talking about, you know, different fragrances that they wanted to see, going deep into the ingredient profiles. Um, so with that information, I was able to just build. Um, so as you, as you can see, it was you know, very organic beginnings. I didn't start with a, a strong business plan, you know, really just grew from the hobby and then the confirmation from customers that what I was making was something that more people wanted. And how long had you been selling at the farmer's market, uh, 
before like retailers began approaching your stand and, and getting interested? Was it because those focus groups were like obsessed with your products and then they're like, oh shoot, I missed the farmer's market today. Where else can I find, you know, Jamie's deodorant or what did, what did that look like? Yeah, that was definitely happening. I had customers going into stores asking if they carried Schmitz. Um, retailers didn't know about me, but then they started to learn. And I actually, you know, had some retailers approaching my booth. And once that happened, I was like, this is it, I'm going in. Because um, I hadn't, you know, first thought about retail opportunities. I thought, okay, you know, maybe I'll sell on my website, set up an Etsy shop. Um, but locally, I mean, the retailers were really interested because you know, it was a Portland made product. They love naturals. Um, so it didn't take long for me to get on the shelves locally. And then from there, word spread, um, made my way you know, up to Seattle and down the West Coast. And then um, next thing you know, within a year, I mean, I had pr pretty significant national distribution. That is just like incredible growth that I think every entrepreneur, you know, dreams of. So kudos to you, um, you know, but for the, the rest of us in the audience, um, you know, these retailers are, are starting to get interested. You're starting to see growth within the local market. Um, where is, you know, the, the money coming from to begin expanding the business and, and buying more raw materials? Are you still, you know, making the product in your kitchen at this point? Or are you starting to be like, okay, we need to, to get this legit, go into like a manufacturing plan or like, what did that, that process look like? Yeah, it was definitely a balancing act of like understanding where I needed to spend and where I had to cut corners. Because um, on a personal level, I did not have a lot of money. I, my husband and I were both social workers when we got pregnant. Um, so our combined salary was like $35,000. Uh, we, wow. we, we had a kid. Um, and so every extra dollar we had, you know, was, was put into the business, but I did understand too that, you know, for the first um, couple of years, I would need to have some sort of side hobby. You know, his income was, was enough to sustain the household, fortunately. Um, but then just to kind of kickstart, you know, Schmitz and have that seed money until I started seeing revenues, um, I, I did take on a couple of side projects. Um, but what was really important to me was to make sure that whatever jobs I took had some sort of significance to my plans and goals for Schmitz. So for example, I took a job at a local retailer that was selling my product just so I could see it on store shelves, watch customers interact and just really understand the inner workings of retail. Um, it didn't pay a lot, but it was enough to, you know, just kind of keep things going. Uh, I also took a job with a local e-com um, retailer who was making DIY kits. So I was, you know, formulating things like lotions and stuff, which was also helping me kind of, um, I guess, make my, my own formulas better and just use that opportunity for R&D as well. Um, so those little projects, were, it wasn't a ton of money, but it was enough to just sustain some of the expenses. Um, and then taking on our D to C, you know, within those, um, within a couple of years, that's when the money really started to be a little bit, you know, we see a healthier flow. Um, Cause with D to C, you can put that money right back into the business. There's no cuts for, for wholesale. You're not waiting for a check from the retailer. Yeah. But with that, you know, I was putting that money directly back into operations. Um, but I did build out in-house manufacturing. So it's crazy to think that that was enough money to sustain that growth. Um, so I'd started on my kitchen stovetop and then scaled up, um, you know, from batch sizes of 20 dealers to soon making you know, 200. And then just wow. slowly building up um, our equipment needs. I was very frugal with um, my warehouse needs. You know, I found a place right around the, the block from where I lived and negotiated with a, a local contractor on how to, you know, build it out to, to what I needed and just kept things like, didn't have a lot of, you know, extras and, and <laughs> the office was nothing to, to, to showcase or to brag about, that's for sure. That's yeah. an, an incredible. Um, so I know you mentioned that, you know, you and your, your husband were both social workers, not bringing in a lot of money. Um, you know, we know you didn't go to outside VC or anything like that. Um, but did you have any like family members that were helping support in the beginning? Were you like selling off your, your stuff or, you know, just kind of like at what point did you have to cut personal finances then to lead you um, and, and have that stream of revenue to help put into the business. Right. I didn't have money coming in from family. Um, but I, you know, I'm privileged in the sense that I, I knew my family was available if I needed. 
um, you know, they were very frugal with their own money and didn't have a whole lot of extra, but I knew if like some major disaster happened, hopefully, you know, they'd be there to pick me back up. Um, but I think just having those side hobbies, I also started doing a little bit of um, private label work for the business, which was a nice way to get um, my, my brand out there. Um, and then to kind of make my way into some local retailers too. So I was making, for example, some massage lotions for local massage parlor. Um, nice. and then it did, but it did get to a point where, you know, those projects became distracting and I had to cut them off and then go hundred percent in on Schmidt. So it wasn't easy to know the right time to do that. You know, people ask me often, you know, how long should I sustain the side hobby? When should I fully commit to the business? And I don't think there's a magic, you know, number, you know, for sales goal to have to really determine that, but you'll know, you know, you'll know how your time is being allocated to each project. You'll know, you know, where the demand is really pulling you. And um, yeah, it's, it's not easy though. And I think, I think today it's, it's even harder um, to pull off bootstrapping. I think because it's, each industry is incredibly competitive. Um, brands are coming up quickly. And, you know, if you need that extra money to, to give you that push, I think it's, it certainly has its place. Yeah. So, um, very smart. Uh, it's so, it's so interesting that, you know, you're raising a son, you have a family, you're doing these side projects of massage oil, and then, you know, you're building the business and, you know, at what point were you like, okay, do I do the graphic design? Do we hire an agency? Um, you know, cause you were kind of managing all of the different roles at that point. Um, so at, at what point did you start thinking like, okay, I need to, to hire someone and what did, you know, what was that first role then for you? Yeah. My, my first packaging was, um, designed by a friend. You know, I was fortunate that we were able to work out you know, a nice deal where he, he designed my logo, which <laughs> was a picture of me wearing a bonnet. So it was this very like homestead feel. <laughs> um, and I was packaging my products in mason jars. Um, yeah. But back then, you know, at Farmer's Market scene, it worked. You know, people were drawn to that. Um, but once I made the decision to, you know, really focus on wholesale and I saw the opportunity there, um, then I knew I had to shake up the branding. And so that was my first big expense, you know, was to find a local designer, um, but even with that, I had to do a lot of negotiating and, you know, generally when you work with a designer, they want to do a whole package of, you know, your branding and your packaging and your marketing plan and this and that. But I said, I just want like three labels and that's it. And so we were able to work out a deal. Um, and so it's just, again, like knowing where to spend and kind of where to cut corners. Um, I brought on my first uh, employee to help with production, um, very part-time, you know, he was working in my garage before I had made the move. Um, even coming into my house and eating lunch with me and stuff, you know? <laughs> but you do what you have to do. And, um, and I think, you know, back then in those very early days, when you are trying to hustle and you don't have a lot of capital at your disposal, I think hiring friends makes sense. Um, but it gets tricky later, um, you know, as a business gets bigger and maintaining those friendships and relationships and what that means. And, um, so I always, you know, I get asked that a lot, like, do you recommend hiring friends? And I, I think as long as you both have a clear understanding of what the arrangement is that you're getting into and what the long-term plan might look like, I think it's okay. Um, yeah, but I think it was certainly helpful in, in a bootstrapping scenario like this. Yeah, using the resources that you have around you mm -hmm. and hoping that you have good enough friends that they'll do it for free and, and give you a, a discount. Um, so there, there are many different sources of funding that entrepreneurs going can go after from asking that one rich uncle for money to angel investing to CVC and even going the Kickstarter route. Uh, can you talk us through why you decided to go the bootstrapping route, especially when you saw, you know, that high growth and you knew that you were going to be working with, um, you know, retailers like Target that have, you know, kind of crazy demands. Yeah, honestly, I, I saw fundraising as a distraction when I was growing my business because of the way that the brand grew so organically, you know, I never took the time to like really put out a plan. I'm like, okay, how am I gonna, you know, fund this? It was in this, things just started moving so quickly. And so what I was doing was working, recycling the money back into the business. Um, and I, you know, I, I gave it some thought, of course, like every entrepreneur does, but I really could not see myself taking the time to build the deck, taking time for the meetings with investors and then the potential for, you know, me getting thrown off track with the vision that I had for my business. Um, and so 
it's not, it's not for every entrepreneur. And I think it's, it depends on your product type, depends on the industry that you're working in. Um, but looking back, I mean, I certainly, you know, it's something like a crowdfunding campaign could have probably been helpful in a lot of ways. Um, but when you mentioned Target, you know, and some of these bigger retailers. So seven years into the business, that those conversations started happening. And that's when things got really, really tight and stressful and overwhelming in terms of, of cash. Um, we had, you know, very significant revenues. Um, but once you start selling in those bigger retailers, your money is just tied up in inventory. Um, so it's sitting on the shelves, you're waiting, you know, 90 days to get paid. Um, and we, at that point I did take out a line of credit, you know, that was really helpful. And I think that's a good option for some people. Um, but that gets pricey and that gets, you know, time consuming as well. Um, so if you have, you know, people, there's this assumption too, that everybody has access to friends and family. And I think that's a good choice for some, but not everybody has that, you know, privilege. And, um, and I think it's important that people, that we don't push that on people, you know, all the time. And so, um, exploring other options like loans and like, and some crowdfunding opportunities, the equity crowdfunding is becoming really big. Um, and I think that's a nice choice for the right type of product. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so when I was doing some research for today's talk, um, I heard a story on how you woke up one day with a $300,000 tax bill from your accountant and you didn't have the money to, to pay that. And I feel that situations like that happen all the time to entrepreneurs. All of a sudden, you know, something goes wrong. You have to scratch the whole batch and, and that's wasted money. Um, you know, when you receive those unexpected bills or, or product failures? How did you go about resolving those issues financially? Yeah, the tax bill specifically, you know, we just requested an extension and then just believed in the power of, of our, these new retail partnerships we had like, like Target, you know, we were hopeful and that these things would pan out. Unfortunately they did. Um, but I was stressed out constantly and wondering, yeah, like, what is my backup plan here? Like, what will I do if I literally can't pay my taxes? And um, it's hard to, because as you're scaling, that means hiring more people and then balancing out salaries, right? You want to be, I want, I always wanted to be that employer that like paid my employees like way more than you know anybody else. But as a startup, like that's, that's impossible. And so, um, you know, treating your employees well and like just knowing that like they are, they're making sacrifices, you know, alongside you and just. There's, it, there's so much to manage. And I think it really comes down to, again, like being, knowing where to spend and where not to spend, but in, in being very willing to, to spend a lot in certain places, right? If you, if you see that certain expenses are resulting in increased sales and, you know, direct customer conversions for your business, that's where you have to focus. And I think sometimes with investor money, we, we can get a little careless and we're not as intentional about the way we spend. And, um, you know, a good example there might be how you're putting, um, how you're putting money into your ad strategy. Um, you know, we had to watch that really closely and make sure that every single ad we we're putting out was directly, you know, converting into sales. Where if you have, you know, abundance of capital, you can get a little lazier or that kind of thing. And um, so the great thing about bootstrapping, you know, even if you're only doing it for a few years, is that you gain this you just value money so much and you gain like the scrappiness and this ability to just like learn how to hustle and like learn how to like make the most of what you have. And as a company gets bigger, like that becomes really, really important. And just, you know, it's something that you always appreciate. Yeah. And I also think that when you kind of take on money early on, you, you lose some of the autonomy. And then as you're growing, you still really want to have that connection, you know, with your consumers and, and those that are buying your product instead of, you know, kind of VC money dictating and navigating what that growth looks like and, and how you're connecting with your consumers. Um, at any point, did you have VCs approaching you and, and how did you navigate those conversations? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, private equity firms, VCs, potential acquirers, you know, we're constantly reaching out. And um, it was nice to know, like, it was sort of like a, a comfortable, you know, back to a plan, I guess, if we really got desperate and needed to pursue those opportunities. So I kind of just filed them away, you know, knew, knowing that they were there if we needed them. Um, PTYL. <laughs> and then in 2017, um, that's when, when Unilever um, approached and we had actually a few strategics that were kind of knocking on the door interested um, but the timing was great because again that was the year that we launched in mass so it was target costco walmart you know we, we had launched within months of each other 
so so much inventory was tied up. We were waiting on um, our, our invoices to be paid and, and no we really sleep. <laughs> got to a point where we were going to start approaching um, outside VCs and start entertaining those conversations. And, um, but with Unilever, you know that there was a lot of opportunity there that would have solved not just the money problem, but you know other, others too. And also access, you know, being able to to get your product in other countries and and other stores around the world. I'm sure that was really helpful um, for you guys and the expansion yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. And with Schmidt, you know, I, I took a different approach to distribution that other natural brands weren't yet doing. Um, I saw the opportunity in mass retail where others wanted to stay more niche. And, you know, that I think is really what set us apart and caught the attention of Unilever because they saw that we could reach a huge customer base. And, you know, we really made naturals mainstream and it's something, you know, that just wasn't happening yet. And so we're you know really proud to, to be a leader there. Um, but yes, with Unilever, I mean, we gained access to so much, you know, insights into, you know, consumer insights, um, raw material suppliers that we otherwise, you know, didn't know exist and, you know, price cuts and some of the materials and, um, and like you said, distribution. We were we were international. We actually were selling in um, more than thirty countries when you know we were. Wow. But, you know they were able to to standardize that distribution and expand it. And, so impressive. Um, so on top of that, you I know that you still work with uh, the product in a way as a as more of like a brand ambassador. Um, and now you're really focused on your own investment portfolio with your husband, Color Capital, where you invest in underrepresented founders. Can you share how your perspective has changed from bootstrapping to now advising others to, to take funding? Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned that I'm, I'm still a Schmitz. That's true. You know, I, I think I'll probably always work with the brand. Um, I mostly am involved in their international expansion now and some of the product development. Um, so still very attached. Um, but yeah, I started an investment fund with, with my husband, Chris Cantino. Um, he was there alongside me growing Schmitz. And so the two of us have really strong operational experience. Um, so we started this fund about a year after the acquisition, um, just saw opportunity to really have a hand and um, consumer products companies that, um, you know, we're starting from, from nothing like, like I did. Um, and we do prioritize investments in underrepresented entrepreneurs. Like you said, um, we just see opportunity there that's, that's overlooked and we just want to see change. Um, the great thing is, you know, since we've started doing this, we've connected with a lot of other VCs and investors who, who do come to us for deal flow from women and people of color that they just don't see on their desks. Um, so I'm proud to say that we have a healthy, um, flow of deals that we you know, will pass um, on to others and just get more exposure for some of these founders. That's incredible. Well, I feel like we could, you know, talk all day, but I'd love to turn it over to the audience and get some of their questions answered. Um, let's see, we've got in today's market with startups being accelerated by VCs and investors, do you think a startup that's bootstrapping can emerge in the market just as well, or would that slow down its growth? I do think it would, it would probably be slower. Um, but if it's the type of product where speed might not be as important, then, then I think it's okay. Um, I do talk a lot about how, you know, Schmitz really had slow, easy growth in the early years, but then once it hit certain distribution channels, then it just really took off. Um, so I think it just depends on your product, you know, what the competitive landscape looks like and um, really how quickly you want to get to market. And then we've got, what was your lowest point starting out? Did you ever get to a point where you just wanted to, to quit? Yeah. Yeah. Throughout the growth of the business. I mean, I, there were always those moments of like, what am I doing? How did I get into this? And like, as, as the business gets bigger, it weighs more heavily on you. And there's so much, so much more that you're responsible for, including like, you know, a team of 150 employees that I was managing and you know, knowing that their livelihood was depending on me was, was really stressful. Um, so I certainly had moments of feeling overwhelmed. And, um, but what really kept me on track was just always going back to, you know, two things, you know, reminding myself why I started, you know, going back to those early days of feeling like I was trying to find my creative side, right. And just finding happiness in my work. And then secondly, just the customer feedback. I mean, that's what kept me going more than anything is just hearing from customers who, were so enthusiastic about the product, you know, some telling me that what I was making was changing their lives, you know, nothing competes with that. So that's, that's what kept me going. 
I, I, I love that. And I think that bootstrapping is very emotionally and, and just mentally taxing at times because you're so focused on your growth, but then you're also so focused on, you know, managing these limited uh, resources. And then you're also raising a son at the same time. Um, what were some things that you did to kind of support your mental and emotional health during those tough times? I think most importantly, I was like cutting myself slack. You know, we're so hard on ourselves as, as parents, as entrepreneurs, and just everyday people in life. And I think it's just so important to realize like not everything's going to be perfect. You know, what does that even mean? Um, and just knowing that you're trying your hardest and then, you know, you'll know if you're giving enough attention to, to the things that are important to you um, and just being, being able to balance that. And, you know, I think one thing that helped with raising my son throughout the growth of the business was like, as he got a little older, just start starting to pull him into some things around the business. Um, so when he was young, you know, having him smell things and ask if he liked certain essential oils and uh, getting his opinion on branding and just really like bringing him into the business, I think just, just helps you feel you know, more connected to, you know, having a more holistic approach to, to parenthood and entrepreneurship. I love that. That sounds really fun. What would you say is a good average timeline for you to test your bootstrap business in the market to avoid exhausting all your resources on one venture? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know that there's, that there's an answer <laughs> to that. Um, I think it's, you know, are you able, are you able to meet demand? I think that's most important is like, what's the demand that's in front of you and can you meet that demand with the, the resources that you have. If you're turning down a lot of opportunities, um, if you can't fill orders, or if you're just saying no to retailers, strictly due to you know, not having enough money, then I think that's a sign that it might be time to start rebooting. Nice. Um, we got a lot of questions on this one. Apart from going to farmers markets, what ad advertising and marketing were you doing to get the word out about your cosmetics? Yeah, the, so this was 2010, 2011 when Facebook ads were, were new and really effective and really cheap. <laughs> so we used a lot of that. Um, and then when Instagram launched, we, we took advantage of that. Um, and then our Google ad strategy, you know, again, always paying very close attention to how each ad was performing and testing out different messaging, testing out different audience groups. And just um, my husband, Chris, you know, took that on um, so that I was fortunate to have that in house where I wasn't having to you know, partner with an outside agency. Um, but that's really important is just staying on top of the ads. And did you leverage any like influencer marketing at all if you were on Instagram or was it solely just ads? Just thinking about that. So le less on Instagram, but more on YouTube. So the YouTube was, was, you know, really, really beneficial back then in the early days. We just gifted product and people were excited about it and they were willing to make, make YouTube videos about it. And um, that really helps spread the word. And I think a lot of people used to, and still do, maybe less so today, but would go to YouTube for product reviews and to learn about new, new brands. Um, we actually had put together this cool compilation video of all the YouTube reviews we had gotten. And it was really cool just, just to see like, like hundreds of people talking about Schmitz and, and one video clip. And um, that was really useful to land retail accounts too. You know, we would share the video, and show that there was, there was interest and, and demand for the product. I love that. And then every time you watch it, you're just smiling because you're like, this is so cool. All these people love what, what I created and it's making an impact. Um, can a startup remain bootstrapped until IPO? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think that's tricky. I think it probably depends on the, the type of product and, and um, how big, you know, you, you, you want to be when you go to market. Um, but I would probably probably have a plan for funding. I think it'd be, even if you don't follow through with it, I think it's always important just to entertain conversations with investors. Um, I think that's one thing that I probably would have done differently when growing my brand is just knowing what the VC scan landscape looked like, you know, having a, at least a rough pitch prepared. I think, because when you need to pull the trigger, you know, you're not scrambling and coming at it with like zero information or research. So I think it's just good to be prepared. Yeah, most definitely. Um, can you share more about your portfolio at Color Capital? If anyone in the audience is, you know, interested in learning more about it, how they can go about doing so and, and just kind of like what types of founders you you generally work with? Yeah, so we're, you know, we prioritize investments in consumer products, companies, because that's what we're passionate about and where we can have the most impact. 
Um, I love, I love founders with, um, you know, kind of a scrappy story like mine who just have a real passion for what they're building. Um, and I think it's important when a founder can show, you know, why they're the best person to build this product. You know, what's the story there? What's the founder market fit? Um, I like products that are brands that are really open to exploring distribution channels that are outside um, kind of the norm for the industry. So a great example of that is when I was building Schmitz, as I mentioned, you know, I really, I saw opportunity in retailers like Walmart, you know, where my competitors just wanted nothing to do with that type of retailer. You know, they saw their product as a more kind of elevated niche, natural offering. Um, so I, I like brands and founders who are kind of open to exploring, you know, channels that otherwise might be untapped. Great, terrific. Um, let's see. Do you have a co-founder and how did you select your, your co-founder? I don't. I, well, I started Schmitz alone in my kitchen in 2010. Um, I always call my son my co-founder because I was <laughs> when I started and he's been there alongside me. Um, you know, my husband's been there even, you know, before he officially came on, he was supporting me in other ways, you know, maybe working on some of my copy for my website, building my website, picking up raw materials, running errands. Um, and then I officially brought him on in 2014. Um, and then I had a business partner come in in 2015 and worked with him for a couple of years. But, um, but now I'm, I'm, I'm the sole founder. And that's, that's a topic, I think, for, you know, a whole, whole conversation in itself is just like, the, you know, the benefits and the challenges and risks to, to taking on co-founders, I think, um, you know, can go both ways. Absolutely. Uh, what resources would you recommend for a new entrepreneur to use to learn how to manufacture and distribute their product? Or were there any resources that you use that were, you know, really beneficial for you as you were growing your business? I always say there's, there's two ways that consumer products come to market. One is um, through a product that you make, right? You're a maker. It's something that you enjoy producing. Um, and then the second way or excuse me, so you, you make your product and then you have your business idea, right? Like that's how Schmidt started. I had been making something. I didn't quite understand that it was a business until I realized the potential. Um, and then there's the second way to come to market is you have a business idea and then you have to figure out how to make the product, which generally means working with a co-packer or contract manufacturer. Um, so I think it's, they're both very different ways to come to market. If you're, if you're a person who has a business idea, but you haven't dabbled in making or manufacturing, you know, maybe a co-packer is the right fit for you. Um, somebody that's going to produce the product on the outside. If you are making in-house, like for example, if you're a baker or a sewer or deodorant maker, um, then then you yeah, you have to learn how to scale it up yourself if you want to keep it manufacturing in-house. And it's challenging. There was no book that I read. Um, I a lot of it was my intuition and just like learning as I went. A few years in, I did take on a consultant locally who specialized in building out manufacturing facilities, and that was really helpful. Um, but it's pricey, you know, you have to do it when the time is right. Um, but if you believe in your product and your business potential, I think you just learn as you go. Totally. Well, one final uh, uh, question for you. Do you have a favorite scent of deodorant from Schmitz? What's yeah, your favorite? Yeah, it's a Ling Calendula. It was one of my originals. Um, it's one of our lowest sellers, to be honest. It's not as popular as some of the others, um, but it's so beautiful. And I just think it, it smells amazing. And the, you know, it's one that I personally formulated. And so I'd be curious to hear if somebody else has a favorite. So I don't know if we have time for that. <laughs> Let's see, Let pull up the chat again. How did you guys decide on, on like the different scents? That was, when to roll them out. Yeah. So the, the, the earliest line, um, you know, all the offerings were just stuff that I liked. Um, I really enjoyed essential oils. So I was always playing with the fragrances. And, um, and then again, you know, getting feedback directly at the market. Um, but as the company got bigger, you know, we used consumer insights. We would survey our customers through newsletters and social media and ask, you know, what fragrances they wanted to see. Um, and one of our top selling fragrances is rose and vanilla. And that was um, a crowdfunded um, uh, scent. So we basically cool. did a survey asking what scent people wanted to see. And the top two answers were um, rose and vanilla. Interesting. Yeah, it's like crowdfunded, but it crowdsourced. <laughs> I love it. Well, my personal favorite is the lavender. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we could, you know, talk about you and everything you're working on all day long. Um, but we're about... Uh, 
out of time for today, but thank you so much for, for being here today, Jamie. Uh, you know, I feel like I've learned so much about you and your story and bootstrapping and, and, you know, personally as someone that doesn't come from a family or, of money and, you know, still kind of making my connections in the startup space. It's really inspiring to hear that someone that can start with like a $30,000 salary can end up, you know, building a really incredible, impactful business and then sell it to, to you Lever. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Enjoy uh, San Diego with all the sunshine and, and avocados. Um, and thank you so much. Thanks, Mayla.